Okay, so I'm going to the Sermon on the Mount, and that's Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, and this is in the middle of the last chapter, so it's right near the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's when Jesus tells us in Matthew, it's really verses 13 and 14, but the title comes from choosing the narrow gate. Sometimes we say the narrow road that leads to life, but it actually says the narrow gate that leads to life. So Lord, we ask you to help us, just like he had to make a choice, when he was confronted in that situation about which way does he lean, and he didn't want to offend anyone, but he prayed and he listened to you, and you told him which gate to walk through. It wasn't the easy gate. It wasn't the wide gate and the wide road with lots of people on it. It was the narrow gate. And because of that, Lord, we are empowered and encouraged today, and, and we receive the impartation for courage because the narrow gate is always the more opposition and the more difficult one in the natural, but, but we're not going for what the world says. We want what you say, Lord, and we know that you care about every single decision that we make. We don't want to be legalists. We just want to have this open communication with you all day, every day, in every situation, to know which choice to take. Thousands of decisions that we make every day, thoughts that we have, Help us to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I find that to be a really challenging verse, to take every thought captive. <laughs> right? Like, I can't even remember. Sometimes I get up and go in the other room. I can't even remember what I went in the other room for. Does that ever happen to anybody? Am I the only one? And I'm like, what is wrong? And then I realize hitting myself on the head is not going to make that better. Right? <laughs> so we all have that issue of focus. And... And those thoughts can creep in and look, I'm really not trying to make this legalistic and giving you things that you have to say every morning. I'm just trying to help you to stay in a place where your passion remains above neutral for the Lord. Like, right? He doesn't want us to be lukewarm. You can't always be at a 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. I get it. But we don't have to get to zero or negative either. And, 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 and being around other Christians that are fired up for the Lord that don't lean but that take a stand really helps. I was, I think I mentioned I was reading a book while we were in Italy, and, and the author, was, it was, the whole book was about the Holy Spirit. And it was like, if Paul came back, one of the things he would be most shocked about is the, the lack of value we place on the community aspect of church. The idea that, yes, of course, it's, a, it's wonderful that we can look online, but we really need to be assembled together with other believers. Amen? So don't, don't neglect the value of the people that are all around you every time you come together. Not just this church, whatever church you're with. That's the body of Christ. If they're, if they're Bible-believing church and spirit-filled people, that's, that's the army of God. That's the remnant that, that we all need to be with. So choose the narrow gate that leads to life. Um, I'm, I'm putting the emphasis on choose because so much of life, I mean, right, even in the course of my day, I'll walk into the cleaners and the lady behind the counter, I say, happy Tuesday, <laughs> or whatever day it is, you know, like nobody else is saying that to her, and she'll smile because, like, she's in the rut of this job, and like, oh, here's the guy that's, that's happy. <laughs> it's a choice. Oh, it's only Tuesday, man. I can't wait till the hump day. Like, well, okay, if that's how you want to live, but I'd rather live with optimism than pessimism. If we have the Holy Spirit, man, we have joy, unspeakable. So this is the, the two verses, 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. All right, so this is, I would... I would open it up and say beyond just salvation and walking through the gate of salvation and saying yes to Jesus, which I'm assuming most all of you here have done, then it's a matter of how do I become his disciple? How do I keep making better and better choices? And like we do with children, you wouldn't try to teach calculus to most four-year-olds, right? There's an expectation based on where they are in their maturing process. But by the same token, you would hope that somebody who's 21 years old knows how to give you change from the counter when you're in the store, right? So there's different levels of expectation, and that's good, and, and God does that for all of us. And as a minister, you know, my wife and I now, um, I've just celebrated 40 years of being saved. She's been saved longer than I have. It's easy to plateau. If you're not careful, now, I, that one, I don't believe that will ever happen for Tricia. 
because there's a fire inside of her that is like the Energizer Bunny. It never goes out. And, and that's wonderful to be with someone like that who's got, you know, the sole purpose is to please the Lord with everything that she does. And I knew it the first time I met her, even before I met her, when I heard her speak, there was a spark in there. And we might not all have that, but we can all ask the Lord to help us get there because that's the best way to live your life. Not the little offhanded, well, you know, don't be legalistic about it. He's, he's, he, once you have your salvation, he can't take it away. He's not an Indian giver. A little sin here and there, what's the big deal? Thank you. That's leaning. I, can't, I didn't even know I was going to have that example to use, but I don't want to lean. I want to stand on the rock of my firm foundation. Winds came, storms blew, my house was built on you. Amen. Woo, thank you, Lord. So I just keep bringing it to the front burner. You know, that's my example is when you're cooking on the stove, it's a front burner. And, and that's where the heat comes up. Like, I want to keep him at the front burner of my mind all day long because he's going to give me better answers than I would come up with myself. Unless the Lord builds a house to finish it. Just labor in vain. Anybody labored in vain? I'll wait. All of you have done something, and you know that you labored in vain. If I had just prayed about it first, mm -hmm. seek first man's logical answer. <laughs> no, everything you do, seek first the kingdom of God. And that was a proactive way that you can make choices, right? And that's part of that handout that I gave you that I'll get to in a minute. But I can make a decision in the morning when I get up that I know that my flesh is weak. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. That's right out of Scripture. So I can do some certain things in the morning, especially as I'm starting my day, to say, Lord, I want to take every thought captive today. I want to say, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All these things that we could just practice as good discipline compared to wake up in the morning and start scrolling Facebook. Stepping on anybody's toes. <laughs> I don't want to step on anybody's toes. I'm just saying, like, we, we put up a video every day on Facebook, so I'm not against the platform, but we've got to be careful what's going in here. There's a gate, right? There's a gate on your eye. There's a gate on your ear. There's a gate on your heart, and, and we want it to be holy. We want it to line up with the Lord. Why? Because we flourish when we're obedient, and the enemy's a really good liar. He might be the forever loser, but he's really bitter and sarcastic and nasty and angry. And those are none of those are on the fruits of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit, excuse me. So the proactive thing could be, I'm going to pray every morning. When I get up, before I leave the house, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to say, let your kingdom come. Give me this day my daily bread. However you choose to do it. I don't like legalistic, repetitious things. So, because that could tend to be the same as, if, imagine if we sang the same song every week. Eventually, your brain would just check out. It doesn't matter how good the song is because that's not what a relationship's about. Imagine if you walked in from, from work and you read a script to your spouse. How was your day, honey? Well, at 9 o'clock, I did this. At 10 o'clock, I did that. That's not a relationship. Well, not a healthy relationship anyway. So that's how God wants to be with us. And prayers are good. I'm not saying don't write things down. But just be careful it doesn't become a ritual that loses life. And what are the verses that you have memorized? And, you know, I gave you a whole bunch of verses there, and I changed it to the first person, right? So we'll, we'll get there. But, like, this is how you could do it. There's something powerful about speaking out the word with your own voice, your spirit. He hears your voice in the morning speaking things that will break habits. If you do it, you know what they say, 21 days. If you do it for 21 days, that old habit gets broken. And the new habit is I'm going to put him first because that's been the best investment I could ever make. Am I the only one that would be dead right now if you didn't get saved? Okay, so that means, like, that was the best investment because I wouldn't even be here. But then there's also the reactive prayers. So proactive is I get up and I say, I'm going to pray today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, what, what's your plan for me today? Like he said, say it, Sammy, say it. I want to have that switch on, right? And he, he was open enough to be listening. Really, Lord? Really? I could say that? Yeah, say it, Sammy. And then we would be disobedient if we didn't say it, right? So reactive is pray before you speak, and especially before you hit send on that angry email, which is all in caps. I can almost guarantee you 100 out of 100 times 
Give it the 24-hour rule, read it the next day, you're going to at least reword it and not have it in capitals, right? Because in that moment of that Italian temper coming up, uh-oh, yeah, watch out, right? Because then that's a forever record. <laughs> that email stays up there in the cloud forever. And they'll use it against you, won't they? Corporate America is slick. They'll bait you, bait you, bait you, bait you. Only takes you one time to take the bait. And now they have a record that you put it in writing. I want to be wise as a serpent, but gentle as a dove. That's scripture, right? I want to recognize if I'm in the world, I'm not of the world. And that I can prosper in the world, just like Daniel did, like so many people in the Bible that were put in difficult situations. But because they were aligned with the right kingdom, they prospered in the earthly kingdom. And I'm telling you, I've been doing this a long time, and there's not one thing the Lord tells you to do that if you do it, you won't succeed more in the business world. Even though in the short run, it looks like your boss asked you to do something. Oh, you know, it's just a little white lie. Really? Now there's shades of lying? Maybe if it's, honey, how do I look in this dress? <laughs> I want to stay married, Lord. Come on. <laughs> worldview. <laughs> this is really the big one. Because the worldview spits out answers out, out of your mouth that you don't always get a chance to think about. And you say what you believe, but you really do what you believe. It's easy to say you believe something, but it, it's really in your actions that it comes out about what you really believe. I won't go too deep on that, but just use that in the back of your mind that my worldview is going to dictate my output and what I really believe. This world's going to hell in a handbasket. Well, that's not going to give you a very optimistic look about life. And you're going to be like, today, Jesus, you coming back today? In case you didn't hear me yesterday, would you hurry up? Like, that's not very optimistic, is it? We're here. Let's make the best of it. We've got all these amazing tools that the Lord has given us. So the worldview could be, what do I believe is true? Which gate should I walk through, right? And this is that verse I already quoted, 2 Corinthians 10.5. I highly recommend you memorize this because it comes back up in your spirit all the time. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We could think about lots of cultural ways that this gets applied, but, the, but a very common one for young adults right now is I'm going to live with my girlfriend, I'm going to live with my boyfriend before we get married because, you know, you're supposed to try it out, right? I mean, even a pair of shoes, you try them out before you buy them, don't you? Like, really? Oh, you're marrying shoes, are you? Really? That's an argument in the culture that seems logical, but we cast that logical argument down because it's, first of all, it's not even true. You could talk to secular psychologists. They have statistics and studies on all of this stuff. The failure rate of marriages is higher for people who get married after they live together. It's a sacred covenant relationship. Amen? Just say amen. Some people are not smiling right now. <laughs> Every high thing that exalts itself. The knowledge of God says sexual relations is between a committed relationship between a man and a woman. Anything else outside those boundaries is a sin. Okay, I didn't write it. Well, which way do you lean? I'm standing on that promise right there. And every time I do another wedding, it, the Lord reinforces it to me even more how much of a sacred thing this is. I'm taking that argument and I'm casting it down and saying, no, your way is the right way. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity. Now, I don't expect you to leave here today. I hope it happens. One time I prayed for Cheryl Price. She said, I really have a hard time with numbers. I know you're in finance. Could you please just lay your hands on my head and make the numbers work better? I did, and it worked. <laughs> she said it. I don't, you know, she said, oh, my God, it makes sense to me now. So I hope from here that you go out of here and every thought you could take captive. But don't get discouraged if it doesn't happen. It still can happen. It might be progressive, right? But at least if we're thinking about it and it's one of our goals, we'll start catching ourselves. I think I mentioned that Trisha had a, a sermon a few years ago about fast from negative confessions. Oh, my God, is that hard to do. We found out how hard that was. How about this is, this is one of the ones on your handout here, okay? What if I said this every day when I wake up? This is the day that you have made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. That's a positive confession. We're just quoting scripture. 
and you're saying to your spirit, man, and your soul, out of your mouth, your spirit's hearing your voice say, I'm making a choice. You made this day, Lord, and I'm going to rejoice in it. Let's say this one together. Today, I will invite your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's do another one. Today, I choose to love you, Lord, with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind. I will love my neighbor as I love myself. I will treat other people the way I would want to be treated if I were in their shoes. What translation is that? Who's my neighbor? <laughs> That's a hard one, isn't it? Everybody's my neighbor. Yeah, I mean, I'm supposed to put myself in their shoes and then try to treat them that way. Man, that's an advanced course. That's what he said. You got room for a couple more? Yeah. All right. How about this one? Let's do it. I will not be conformed to this world, but I will be transformed by the renewing of my mind through the word of God, through the Holy Spirit, through worship. All the things that are redemptive for the kingdom are going to renew my mind away from the world. Come on, I will study to show myself approved by God, a workman who need not be ashamed. I will rightly divide the word of truth. I will discipline my body and keep it under control so I will not be disqualified. I will choose to enter the narrow gate that leads to life in every decision I make. Good deal. Class dismissed. How do we apply it? Matthew 16 this is a real wake-up call, right? He says, for what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? See, when we make the wrong choices and we take the little shortcuts, and I, I can only just, you know, reflect it from the world that I've lived in, in, in the work world, and, you know, they're, they're usually in that gray zone where they're asking you to do something that you know is wrong, but it's not technically in the rule book that, that they can't catch you and, and, and arrest you to do it. Like arrest you, you know what I mean? Like fire you because you, you didn't follow protocol. They, it seems to me at least like they purposely write the rules to give you a little wiggle room. And, you know, as a Christian, you don't have wiggle room. Let, let your yes be yes and your no be maybe. <laughs> That's not what it says. We believe there's such a thing as truth. Absolute truth, and I'm going to try to do it as much as I can. In fact, the name of Holy Spirit, one of his names, the Spirit of Truth, lives inside of you. So if I'm lying, guess what? That's the forever loser spirit, not the forever winner spirit. Which one do you want? <laughs> That's a pretty easy choice. Oh, man, I, I gained worldly goods, but what did I do? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? I sold out my soul in order to go along with the program, and now they can use that evidence against me anytime they choose to, uh, to, to fire me. In fact, I signed a deal that I didn't fully read that said they didn't even need a cause to fire me. They could just fire me without cause. That's, that was the right. You better read the fine print before you just join that company. And this is the way it says it in the voice translation. You know I'm a fan of the voice. It says, there are two paths before you. You may only take one path. Can you tell the person next to you that? They might not have known that today. <laughs> There's two paths. You can only take one. See, I'm good with math. <laughs> one doorway is narrow and one door is wide. Go through the narrow door. Oh, really? Okay, I will. For the wide door leads to a wide, easy path. The easy path has many, many people on it. But the easy, crowded path leads to death. Oh, well, that sounds like the devil in the garden. Did God say that you would die if you ate that fruit? You surely will not die. And you know what? They didn't die, did they? What did Isaac Petrus say? What died? Their spirit died. It brought death into the kingdom. Death had never existed in the kingdom. So their, their willingness to disobey caused them to lose the blessing of obedience. That, ever, that has never changed. We get blessed in obedience. Even if in the short run, you get run through the ringer. And, you know, if anybody's in sales, you know how they can try to motivate you to, to do better next week? Is what every, every Monday morning they do a sales meeting and they add up all the sales of the prior week. And the number one salesperson gets a big prize. And when they do the sales meeting, all the salespeople are, are standing outside. And number one walks in. Dun, da, da, da. 
right? Big celebration, big round of applause. But guess what? If you're like Pee Wee Herman at the end of the line, you're like, oh, here comes the loser. The last guy gets nothing. Spoken like a salesman, right? Well, guess what that motivates you to do that Monday afternoon? I better get my numbers up. Maybe I won't tell my sister-in-law, Anna, about the risks involved in that venture that she wants to go to, because I need the commission. I gotta pay my bills. It's a wide road, man, it's a crowded road. I'm gonna take the narrow gate. You know what, Anna, that's not a good idea. You shouldn't do that. If you were my sister, and you kinda are, sister in love, this is what I would do. And the manager comes in and says, why did she buy a CD and not the annuity? You, you don't make any commission on the CD. And, and he should have really been saying, I don't make any override on the CD. <laughs> I only make an override on the annuity. What do you, why, why didn't you sell her the annuity? Because <laughs> I got the spirit of truth in me. Who you got? Anyway, you're fired. Good. <laughs> Go work for people with a soul. That narrow door leads to a narrow road. See? It's not easy, is it? That in turn leads to life. Take that over death. And it's hard to find that road, and not many people manage it. But if it wasn't possible, he wouldn't be asking us to do it, right? You're not completely gone out of the kingdom if you make a mistake. Nobody's saying that. That's what's so beautiful about what Trisha said. You're not a failure. You tried. Fell short. I mean, you could argue if there was such a thing in God's eyes as failing in that parable of the talents, the one who hid the talent and buried it in the ground, okay, he lost the blessing of obedience. He didn't trade on the talent. The other two tried. So if your children are trying in school, they're not failing. They just might not be cut out for that particular thing, right? You, you only fail if you don't try. And we're all trying, and even everybody you know, I think really at the bottom of their heart is trying the best they can. And then in Hebrews it says, by this time you ought to be teachers yourselves, Yet there I find you, you need to sit down with, I find I need to sit down with you to go over the basics of God again. Baby's milk, when you should have been on solid food. Milk is for beginners inexperienced in God's ways. Solid food is for the mature who have some practice in telling right from wrong. Now, this is something that we don't always hear a lot about from the pulpit because it could sound like I'm, I'm speaking about you got to work harder, you got to work harder, you got to work harder. No. The idea of grace is that you couldn't earn it, you couldn't get your salvation by earning it, but he does want us to be disciples. And disciples are expected to grow. And he uses this example, milk and meat. By now, by this time, you should be on the meat, but you're still on the milk. So that's okay. There's nothing wrong with saying that if, if somebody's up here speaking as a leader, you would expect them to have a maturity in the Lord. In James 3, it says, don't don't take this position lightly. Not many should be teachers because there's a higher level of accountability. But all of us, in one way or another, as Christians, are supposed to be disciples of Jesus, right? So, Ray, do you have that uh, video queued up? Okay, so I just want to show a quick, less than three-minute video from Dutch Sheets. He showed me a vision a few years ago when I, I was at a worship service. It caught me up in the spirit, and I was looking down at the earth, and I saw a circle and I wondered what is he trying to show me this circle on the ground big circle and you know, your mind just takes off I'm like a wheel in the middle of a wheel I, I, it, I, I don't know <coughs> then he pulled me from here to here took me from here to here and I was looking at it from the side and I could see that what I was looking at was not a flat circle, but a cylinder. Spiral. Spiral. From here it looked flat, but from here I could see that it was a spiral. And he said to me, full circle, higher level. I'm bringing some things full circle, higher level. And there was a lot in me it, in that season that he was showing me that he's going to do again. But when God does something again, he always intends for it to be at a higher level of glory. Yes. If it's not going from glory to glory, it's probably not God. 
Because we go from strength to strength, faith to faith, strength to strength, the Bible says. The path of the righteous gets brighter and brighter. We go from glory to glory. So full circle, higher level. And I started preaching about signs and wonders, another, another uh, season of those, harvest, revival, but higher level. And I mentioned this in a meeting, and a spirit-filled messianic rabbi came up to me after the um, meeting, and he said, I was fascinated by that vision. Because he said, uh, that's the way we believe time is in God, not linearly, but cyclically. He said, I believe you saw time. He said, we even believe that God puts things in time in the sense that it will repeat itself. For example, this, this time every year, Passover season, for example, you can more easily tap into this anointing. If you want to see that video, it's a clip on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. That's the, that's the longer teaching. Um, but the point that I wanted to make is this idea of time, and, and if you think of it as almost like a helix, right, like a DNA or that spiral that he's talking about, that is true about life, right, from birth to toddler, grammar school, early teens. We understand that children develop at, at different rates and that we we want them to develop. It's not something where we want to maintain control over them. In, in the language that, that we use in the Elijah House teaching, it's that they have to individuate. Anybody know, know what that word means? You, you've heard it, learned it? Individuate, stand on their own two feet. And this is difficult. As the children are growing up, you have to let go of a little of that control and let them stand on their own two feet and let them make decisions. And, and they, need, they need to learn critical thinking choices, right? So. This is as time goes by, just as we expect children to take on more responsibility and to make better decisions over things that they should know, well, we're no different as Christians, right? We're, we're gonna grow in the things of the Lord and we're gonna get more revelation. But in my father's generation, when people hit 65, they would retire and often their bodies would just be so broken from all the years of physical labor that they couldn't work anymore. But that's not really true for most of us today. Most of us today can have our best years from 65 to 75 and beyond. Bill Hammond, right? You saw him, 89 years old, still preaching, still traveling. Doris Wagner in her 90s, still traveling. Amputated one of her legs. She doesn't care. She still goes and teaches anyway. All right? I mean, wow, that's amazing. But they set the bar pretty high. I don't want to have to retire. I think I could have a Caleb anointing. How about you? I think every one of us could have a Caleb anointing. We could be the people that say, I'm just as strong now as I was then. Even though the outward, the inward man, sorry, the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. The physical body may be breaking down, but not even there necessarily. If I watch my diet, I exercise, I do smart things, watch what I eat, I, I could even prolong the gravity <laughs> trying to take over. But the beautiful thing is, in, in this, this circular thinking, like Dutch Sheets was saying, Looking at it from the side is that the older generation is expected to sow into the younger generation in every area. And that's another way that being together, literally physically sitting next to other Christians, going to fellowship after, going to the baseball night on a Friday night and hanging out with other people, is that you're with like-minded people that you can talk to who will hold you accountable and we can live life together. That's an essence of the gospel in the book of Acts especially. But then the older people can then sow into the, their children as parents, right? Then they become parents and grandparents and all the way through and you see. But again, like what we have to remember is that we can get progressive revelation and typically we do get progressive revelation as life goes on. If I'm a drug dealer, I can become a better drug dealer. <laughs> I can get the wrong kind of progressive revelation. <laughs> But if I'm a Christian and I'm a minister, I can get more understanding of how God's uh, principles work in the earth and how we can offset them so the drug dealers, the atheists, become missionaries for Jesus. That's, that should be our goal. That should be the mission statement, turning atheists into missionaries. Amen? Boy, there's a bunch of atheists around. So 
but there always has been, right? I mean, that's not new. There always has been people. It's right in Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage? Those are the atheists or the heathen that are raging. Tell God to get off my back. Well, okay, you don't, he wants you to do it voluntarily, but it's the sweetest surrender you can ever make. All right, so I'll just quickly go through these two figures that we all know in the Bible. In the Mount of Transfiguration, it says Jesus took Peter, James, and John, led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceeding white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten. And Elijah appeared to him, them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. You all know what? This, you're familiar with this portion of scripture, right? So why Elijah and Moses? Some of you may have looked at this. This is what, uh, like a summary of the commentary said. Moses and Elijah served God extra as extraordinary leaders, but both of their ministries ended prematurely. God told Moses to speak to a rock so it would yield water. In his anger, Moses struck the rock twice. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first heard that, I said, well, that doesn't seem like such a big deal. <laughs> Anybody else? Like, wow, like, really? That's going to keep him out of the promised land? Like, just because he got angry? Well, that's what the enemy tries to do. He'll always throw these lures out in front of you and try to get you to take the bait. But I have to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and recognize when it's that lure. So he struck the rock twice, and because Moses did not obey, God told Moses and Aaron they would not enter the promised land. And soon thereafter, Joshua assumed the leadership over God's people. Elijah, on the other hand, Condemned the worship of Baal, called down fire from heaven, and killed Baal's prophets. Like, that's quite an amazing scene, isn't it, in 1 Kings 18? Jezebel was furious, no surprise, vowed to kill Elijah, and he fled into the wilderness in fear for his life, and even prayed to God to take his life. And then in 2 Kings, his protege that he had been developing, he was being mentored, Elisha took over with Elijah's mantle. Now, they didn't fail, right? They didn't fail, but they were really high-level leaders in the kingdom. And the expectation of a high-level leader in the kingdom is higher than it would be for someone else. And not everybody likes this. I'm, I'm saying it to you to, to be sober-minded that it, it's something we should embrace, okay? It's something we should embrace, that we can run the race to win, it says, every runner runs in the race, but only one wins. Run to win. And this is the best way to look at your faith and to look at the way you should live your life is that, no, I'm not going to be perfect. I'll never be Michael Jordan in basketball, but I'll be the best Peter Roselli, whatever that means. And there are things I can do to stop that. Neither one of these men failed, but their ministries, I believe, this is just, again, my own view of how I've been looking at this, they could have gone longer except for going down the wrong gate. And, and like, a, man, the, the bar just gets set much higher, right? I mean, Jezebel was working some pretty big witchcraft over, over Elijah. And he had a moment of weakness. Did that disqualify him? Well, I, it didn't end so bad. He got taken out on a chariot of fire. So it's not like God didn't call both of them back to meet with Jesus. They weren't in some jail cell somewhere. But why not aim for the highest level that we can get to? Meaning, not, not prestige in the world's eyes, but to be the most effective for God while we're here. That's what this is all about. It's just moving from glory to glory. And he quoted it, right? Dutch Sheets, when he was talking about glory to glory, higher level. It's like every year that goes by, we can rightly expect that we're going to be more like Jesus than we were the year before. If we apply these principles, that's how it works. And then all of a sudden, you don't want to go back to the old way of doing things. You guys Okay. Almost done. Moses and Elijah had unique departures from the earth. Moses died and was buried by God. <laughs> wow. Buried by God in an unknown place in Deuteronomy 34. Elijah was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind, 2 Kings. Their reappearance foretells Jesus as the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. So the law was represented by Moses. The prophets were represented by Elijah. So clearly they didn't lose status with God because they didn't end well, we could say. But what we want is a strong finishing anointing. That's something we can all ask for. Lord, it doesn't matter what I did in the past. I don't know. The start doesn't matter as much as the finish. And, and the longer I'm serving you, the more I should be able to translate the truth into my actions and to see other people's lives transform for the kingdom. 
Amen? All of us. And when we work together, oh my God, the, the, the leverage there is unbelievable, right? And then it says, and it points to the coming resurrection. Hmm. So the fact that Elijah was taken up into heaven is a sign that Jesus is going to ascend and bring the blood to the mercy seat and sit down at the right hand of the Father. Here comes Isaac Petrie again. Now, just for those of you that might be a little skeptical, in Luke chapter 1, we see this scene with Mary. It says, the angel said to Mary, rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. How many here could say you found favor with God? All right, I'll take that one. She was just a teenager, right? And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And like, she's probably scratching her head right now going, well, I don't know about that. Like, how's that going to happen? He will be great, your son, and he will be called the son of the most high God. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I don't know a man? That's a legitimate question, isn't it? She's a teenager. She wasn't sitting there praying, I want to be the mother of the son of God. One day, Gabriel came knocking and had a message from God. And Jesus says, okay, well, I'm not kicking you out yet, but how's it going to work? And he explains it. And then the answer she gives in verse 38 is, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Wow. Not my will, but your will be done. I'm going to be a pregnant teenager, single, and the death penalty is, is what we do here in this culture. So how are you going to get me out of that one? Only took him four verses to convince her, yep, this bears witness. Let's roll. I'll do it. But right in that same chapter, a little earlier in verse 13, the angel said to Zacharias, don't be afraid, for come on, what? Your prayer. prayer. Oh, so they were praying. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now, right there, that's different, because Mary wasn't praying for anything, and Zechariah was. And Zechariah says to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. Same question, sounds like. It sounds like the same question that Mary asked, but it's two different people. Mary was a teenager. He was a priest. He hadn't just been praying for this. He was a priest. Priests are held to higher standards. Shouldn't they be? Of course. So it doesn't end well. He gets a timeout for nine months. I mean, that's not the worst punishment in the world, but he couldn't, couldn't speak for nine months. But boy, when he opened his mouth, he prophesied over his son. You read that one. I'm going to end now. Thank you, Nate. It's getting a little predictable. Psalm 145 says, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. Say amen. amen. Slow to anger and rich in love. Say amen. Aren't you glad he's gracious and compassionate? Slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that he has made. And then in Psalm 103, verse 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgression from us. So listen, everything I'm talking about is not about trying to earn your way into favor with God. No. You're saved. You're in. Okay? Now it's, can I be more effective for you, Lord? And, and the way to be effective for you is to be a better husband, a better parent, a better person, employee on my job, or boss to, to the people who are working for you. There's, there's ways that you can transform me into your image every day. That was the verse that Dutch was quoting when he said, from glory to glory, it's 2 Corinthians 3.18. And in the NIV, it says, we are being transformed into the image of Christ with ever-increasing glory. So every time we do another lap, which is another year in the Jewish calendar, we're going higher. I want to burn that picture in, right? We're going higher. We get a status with the Lord that is servant, right? It's servant. We go down in order to go up. <laughs> we serve in order to gain favor and have authority, whatever that means for you. We're not trying to duplicate you to be somebody else. We're trying to find out who he made you to be. So you can grow into that. Can we stand? All right. I'm drawn to the book of Acts often. I hope you are too, because that's that transition between Jesus' ministry 
and the birth of the church. And, you know, we live in a culture right now where there's more hurting people, emotionally hurting people than at any time in my life. And that means there's a lot of opportunities to talk to people about the Lord. Do it in a non-religious way, but, but make sure that, there's, that they're hearing from you a message of hope that no matter what they're dealing with, God is not surprised and has an answer to get them out of that. Amen? Believe that? So let's just look at what it says. In, in Acts 2.21, it says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Can you say that? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'll go another step and say, Paul wasn't even calling on the name of the Lord. And the Lord just knocked him down on the road and said, I want to talk to you, son. The road to Damascus, right? So even if you don't call on him sometimes, he'll just say, hi, you're on candid camera. It's your turn. But anybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the, the culture tells us to, to hold shame in, not to admit it, to get more likes on social media, all those things. The Lord is saying, no, just be honest and recognize that if you're trying to live your life without me, you can't succeed the same way you can if you invite me in. Right? So well, you, the non-believer might say, well, not everybody's Christians and there's plenty of happy people out there that are married and have jobs. Well, everybody here is, is ready to tell you that any person on the planet would be better off accepting Jesus than not. No matter how good it looks like they're doing right now, they're going to do better with Jesus. And there's a judgment day coming, by the way. There's a day coming where we're all going to have to give an account to the Lord for how we lived our lives. And we want to be able to say, I humbled myself. I recognize I couldn't do it without you. Life is very humbling, isn't it? So in verse 32, this Jesus, this is Peter speaking, this Jesus who has been raised up, who God has raised up from the dead, of which we are all witnesses, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this Spirit which you now see and hear. How many here are filled with the Holy Spirit? All right. Wasn't it a game changer in your life? Make some noise if it was a game changer. Right? So basically what... You can't say yes to the Lord without the Holy Spirit. It's He's the one in there. But when you say yes, Holy Spirit engulfs you. You get baptized. You get submerged in His presence. Let me tell you, who wouldn't want that? Somebody who's so ashamed and so afraid that God would judge them and punish them. We're here to tell you, no. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved doesn't matter what you've done. doesn't matter what heinous crime or sin that you've committed. Paul was a murderer. And God said, you're in. I have an assignment for you. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin. And, and that's really the ultimate choice anybody can make is to say yes to God and no to the world. I've been trying the world, and it's a mess. That's what me and Trisha said separately. We didn't know each other. She got saved before I did, but it was like, well, what I'm doing isn't working too good, so I might as well try you. But I don't want you to wait till that happens. I want you to just say yes now. Let me tell you, there's a bunch of people here that will back you up big time that it's the best decision that you could ever make. It's humbling. You have to repent and say, I'm sorry for the things I did wrong. But man, on the other side of that equation, you feel the love of God. True church, you feel the acceptance of God that you have been forgiven and that you're now empowered by this Holy Spirit and the truth of his word to live a different life, to go forward. Broken addictions off, no more slavery to sin, but now a bond servant of the Lord. So if that's you, you're not a Christian and you wanna say yes, all you have to do is just raise your hand and say, you know what, I heard enough. I want to call out on the name of the Lord and I want to be saved. And if everybody here is a Christian, start bringing some non-Christians to church with you. Amen? Anybody watching online that doesn't know the Lord? Lift your hand. God sees it. You're never alone. God sees it. If you've got some kind of addiction in your life, that could bring so much shame when, you're, when you know you're a Christian and there's something controlling you that... You should be saying, man, I should be doing better than this by now. No, it's okay. Humble yourself. Just ask for help. Say, Lord, 
Help me with this. Take this burden off my shoulder. Take this weight off of me right now. Soul ties with some ex-boyfriend or girlfriend. He can break all of that off of you because there's power in his name. There's power in the blood. There's power in Jesus Christ. He wants us all to flourish and prosper. So I'll just speak a blessing over all of you right now. We will have a prayer ministry team at the altar here today. There's wonder-working power in the name of Jesus. You came in one way, you should leave a different way. If there's weight, weights that are holding you back, release them at the altar today. Come up and get people to agree with you in prayer that that thing is not gonna latch on to me any longer. And can we just make a confession? I will choose the narrow gate that leads to life. Lord, I bless your people. I thank you for the willingness to hear your truth and hear your word and all the gears that we're spinning today, thinking about how we can apply this to our lives. We will wake up every morning and make confessions to you that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And we're not gonna go down any other foreign path. We're gonna hear the voice of the shepherd and no stranger will we follow. I pray you bless them, cause them to flourish this week. And Lord, we thank you already in advance. You'll be with us this weekend in Scranton. And many, many hearts and lives will be touched in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Love you.